Welcome. The young man you're about to meet is out to change how we think and talk about race, and he just might do it, beginning with this cover story in the new issue of The Atlantic magazine. Its provocative title is The Case for Reparations. Yes, reparations, defined in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as the act of making amends or giving satisfaction for a wrong or injury. The wrong or injury in question is what President Lyndon Johnson once called slavery's ancient brutality and the terrible things that have followed it in the name of white supremacy enforced by state power. This article is must reading for every American. The author is the journalist ta Coates, who grew up in Baltimore, lives in Harlem, and teaches writing at MIT. He's now a senior editor of The Atlantic, where in this issue he writes, the payment of reparations would represent America's maturation out of the childhood myth of its innocence into a wisdom worthy of its founders. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Here's exactly what you say. White supremacy does not contradict American democracy. It birthed it, yeah. nurtured it, and financed it. That is our heritage. What is white supremacy? Uh, it is a system uh, that is <laughs> really, really old in this country, which holds that uh, a, a certain group of people who hail you know, with a certain ancestry uh, should always be ensured that they will not sink to a certain level. Um, and that level is the level occupied by black people. Uh, and so what the language of what white means adjusts over time. You know, it, you know, it doesn't need a static thing called white. At one point, you know, Irish people did not fit into that. At one point, Italian people did not fit into that. At one point, Jewish people did not fit into that. Um, and now they do. You know, and we've changed that and we've adjusted. The only people who never fit into that are African Americans. So when you ask whites to look at slavery and its consequences. Right. What are you asking? I am, I am not asking you as a white person to see yourself as an enslaver. I'm asking you as an American to see all of the freedoms that you enjoy and see how they are rooted in things that the country that you belong to condoned or actively participated in in the past. Um, and that covers everything from enslavement to the era of lynching when we effectively decided that we weren't going to, you know, Give, afford African Americans the same level of protection of the law. Uh, it applies to sharecropping when we decided that we were going to, in whole swaths of the country, allow people to be effectively re-enslaved. Uh, it applies to redlining when we decided that people that lived in certain places would get, you know, the largesse of the government and people who would not. It applies today in terms of mass incarceration when we decide that we are going to be harder on crimes committed by certain people or the same crime committed, you know, by certain people. Uh, and, and you know, not be that hard when it's committed by other people. This is heritage, it's, it's with us, it's with all of us. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not with you because you're white, you know, uh, it's with you because you're an American, just like it's with me because I'm an American. I have to live with this too. How so? I think like part of the problem is um, when we talk about this, this is a, a situation of, um, well, what do white people owe to black people? Um, and that ain't really it. It's what the state, what the state, you know, the United States, as we should say, of America, you know, first of all, owes African Americans, but, you know, not, not far behind that, what it owes itself, you know, because this is really about our, our health as a country. And I, and I make that delineation uh, because there are people who, you know, and they would say this, you know, who never held any slaves, you know, who were never voluntarily part of any sort of Jim Crow system, you know, who thought, you know, the country should be doing something different the whole time. Nevertheless, we're all part of this. We're all parties. Whatever solution that, you know, eventually come to will come out of my tax dollars, too, I assure you. Was there something that hit you in the face as you started going back into the past that you didn't expect to find? It is the degree to which um, where we are right now is, is not a mistake and is not inexplicable. Um, we think of the, the, the problem of racism, um, the quote-unquote Negro problem, or the problem with the color line, you know, all sorts of variations of how it's talked about, as something that's really, really hard to figure out. And it's actually not hard to figure out. You can literally see uh, a policy, you know, from the 17th century, uh, stretching up into, you know, uh, if we can, you know, say conservatively, into the 1960s, into the 20th century, the mid-20th century here in America, uh, designed to injure African Americans. If you understand that and if you take that, 
uh, it would not make sense that that would just sort of go away, that that injury would disappear within 50 years of half halting, you know, reform and, and trying to make things better. It's not actually that hard to figure out. We have it at our core that a certain group of people, you know, who are marked by ancestry, you know, who are marked by melanin, must represent a bottom for us. Um, and, you know, you can see that, you know, in the era of enslavement, you can see that literally being written as I, you know, showing the piece into the laws. Um, you can see that, you know, when we decide, you know, to, you know, in this period of enslavement, and yet we still can't, you know, get away from, you know, having a two-tiered society. Uh, you can see it, you know, most depressingly, I have to say for me, uh, when we go to uh, erect our modern safety net during the New Deal, which, you know, progressives and, you know, and I consider myself in that camp, you know, like to say, you know, that, that was the era, you know, that was our golden era. Social Security, when it's initially passed, excluded African Americans. Now, it didn't, it wasn't written that way. It wasn't written that way. What was written was folks who were either, you know, worked as farmhands or worked as help in the house. Domestic were excluded. help. Domestic help, yes, yes, they were excluded. But what that had the effect of doing is excluding, I think, roughly 80% of uh, African Americans in the South and something around 65% uh, of African Americans nationally. And what people will tell you is, well, that got fixed and it did get fixed. Um, but the problem is during those years, people are injured. People are injured. And that's how you get a gap. The fact that you, know, you injure people for those years, it doesn't mean that you know, people will catch up when you eventually fix it. And I say that it relates to us today because the argument that we make about Obamacare and the, the Medicaid expansion is, well, Eventually, market pressures will force those states in the South to catch up. They'll fix it. They'll fix it. But see, in those intervening years, black folks who needed it most, much like black folks who needed it most you know, during, during the era uh, when we passed Social Security, will be injured again. And the fact that it gets fixed will not close the gap. And so the question becomes, why do we keep doing that? You know, why do we look at a map of, of um, Obamacare, as they say, and where the Medicaid expansion has gone through and, and where it hasn't? And why do we see this? you know, swath of the country that's directly identical to where we had plantation slavery. But you set out to find out, and, and I was intrigued that you set out to find out in the here and now. Yes. You didn't start back then. No. You started in Chicago. Right. With a fellow named... Clyde Ross. Clyde Ross, who uh, is in his early 90s now. And one of the essential theses of the piece is that uh, we tend to think of uh, segregation and Jim Crow, and we see, you know, uh, a separate but equal. We see, you know, separate water fountains, separate bathrooms. And I, and I wanted to deepen that and say that the relationship is actually different. It's not merely excluding somebody. It's the taking of resources from one group for the betterment of another group. And this happens in, in all sorts of ways. Slavery is obviously the most direct way. But Clyde Ross, who was born in Mississippi, literally has, you know, his family's land taken out from underneath, him, uh, underneath of him and reduced to sharecropping. Uh, when you talk about Mississippi and you say African Americans not having the right to vote, this is not like a symbolic thing. This is the right to see how your tax dollars are used. It actually has effects on your life. Uh, and he saw that and he moved north. He went, he went served in World War II, uh, noticed that things were a little different in the country, came back, could not live in Mississippi, moved to Chicago, thought it was different, you know, and certainly some things you know, really were different. I don't want to minimize that. Uh, but when he went to get that emblem uh, of citizenship, of, of you know, being part of that you know, big, broad, you know, America, that middle class America that we exalt, a home, when he went to buy a home, he found that he had actually been cut out of society in a much more complicated way. How so? Well, Clyde Ross bought a home uh, at the time, or attempted to buy a home, at a time in which uh, uh, home buying in this country was subsidized, uh, where we had an FHA that insured uh, loans so that, you know, if, for instance, I wanted to go, you know, buy a home uh, and I, you know, weren't able to pay for it, the FHA would say, you know, uh, no problem, we'll cover that if he, you know, walks out on his home. Um, African Americans were totally cut out of that. FHA, Federal Housing Administration. Yes, exactly. Uh, and not only were they, not only were they cut out of it, not only were they cut out of it, we had redlining, which is a phrase that, you know, we all know, but we don't talk enough about, wherein it was said, uh, a neighborhood in which African Americans live cannot receive FHA funding. And that went beyond the FHA. Banks decided who they were going to lend money to based on FHA policy. Largely, they responded to that in much the same way. Uh, on, on the Atlantic website, you'll see we have actual maps where you can look at a city like Chicago and see where the loans were and where the loans weren't. And this was a practice that, you know, lasted on paper, on paper, uh, into 1960 and likely much longer than that. So you go on, until America reckons with the moral debt 
it has accrued and the practical damage it has done to generations of black Americans, it will fail to live up to its own ideals. Talk for just another moment about that practical damage. The most obvious example that is obvious is the wealth gap. You know, um, when you have a, you know, a family, you know, on average, has, you know, has 20 times the wealth, you know, a white family for 20 times the wealth yeah. of black families. And then you can really trace this to actual policy. Um, you see it. Again, you know, when we look at these incarceration rates, it, we, we so see it. I mean, it, the, the gap is so, so huge. It's not a mere minor discrepancy. We, we talk a lot about, you know, the, the achievement gap between black children and white children, you know, but I'm always much more interested in the injury gap. Hmm. Um, a black child that comes into this world is, you know, because of policy, because of the policies of his country, you know, over, over, over many years, is going to arrive with injuries that a white child just isn't. You know, and until we start, you know, decide that, you know, so first of all, until we accept that, <laughs> until we say that, yeah, yeah, until we say we did something as a country, yes, we did do something. You know, we have done something, you know, and in many ways we continue to do things um, that mean that that black child is going to come in with injuries that, that that white child is not. We just aren't having a conversation, and you can't substitute and say, poor children. You know, that, that's a separate problem. That's another problem. It's a real problem, a related problem. But it's a separate problem. Until we, you know, directly confront the problem of racism, I don't think we're getting at it. Help us to understand this point in your piece. Quote, to ignore the fact that one of the oldest republics in the world was erected on a foundation of white supremacy, to pretend that the problems of a dual society are the same as the problems of unregulated capitalism, is to cover the sin of national plunder with the sin of national lying. The lie ignores the fact that reducing American poverty and ending white supremacy are not the same. Right. Explain that. There are plenty of African Americans in this country, and I would say that this goes right up to the White House, who are not by any means poor, but are very much afflicted by white supremacy. This, you know, came up for me very powerfully um, during the, uh, at the height of the birth of controversy about the president. Um, with Donald Trump is, you know, demanding that the president release his, you know, long form birth certificate, and then after that, demanding that we see his transcripts. Um, Barack Obama is the best we got <laughs> as African Americans. I mean, this is as, this is as good as it get. You know, the, the the comedian Sinbad, you know, says, you know, there are no more, there are no black men, you know, raised in Hawaii with roots in Kansas. That's just not going to happen again. <laughs> you know, this is the best we have, and if you don't believe him. <laughs> Then you definitely don't believe me, and you definitely don't believe my son, you know, and you definitely don't believe, you know, uh, these black folks, you know, you know, who are born in Cleveland or born in Baltimore, or born in, you know, Chicago. So, you know, young African Americans who see that, who see, you know, people who have, you know, totally, totally played by the rules and then come to their, you know, neighbors and tell them to play by the rules too, and they see them being treated with a double standard. Um, the message is, you know, you're, you're not really part of this. The message is a broken social contract. There's one social contract for one group of people and another one for you. I'm a strong, strong believer that the filter of racism and the filter of white supremacy is greatly underestimated you know, in this country. And that's, that's really the one thing you know, I, I've tried to get across. I think, it seems um, to me that's why you wrote this article. Yes, yes, yes. No, it's very much why I wrote the piece. And I think like, one of the things is that um, we talk about race a lot. We do. You know, so I think it's like wrong to say, you know, well, we don't have conversations. No, we, we actually talk about it quite a bit. Um, I don't think we talk about it in depth as much as, as much as, you know, we should. And I think part of the problem is uh, when you start talking about it in depth, you know, when you start getting to a level where you say, listen, everything we are, everything we have isn't, you know, is built on past sins, that the, that the things are tied, the things are tied. When you start recognizing that there's something congenital, uh, you know, it's as if, um, it's if, you know, I had a problem with alcohol and I could say, okay, but I'm just going to go into the bar and I'm not going to have a drink. You know, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I don't need to, you know, you know, have any sort of conversation. That's a different conversation than that I have to confess to the fact that, I have, that I'm an alcoholic. That there's something in me, you know, that that's here. And I will always have to cope with that. And I will always have to deal with that. Um, the honesty that that takes, the strength that that takes, the courage that that takes is, uh, is, is pretty, pretty profound. And to have to do that on a national level is, you know, it's not just a weight for Americans. I would say it's, it would be a weight for any society, you know, com comprised of human beings. Um, it's very, very hard, you know, in mass 
for groups. And I, and I, you know, to be honest with you, I have doubts about our ability to do it. Our ability as, as white folks to, no. Say, no. to say we were what this, this nation was founded on white supremacy. It no. is an organizing principle of our society. No, I have <laughs> doubts about us as Americans to do it. I mean, if, if you think about it, for African Americans, it's a very depressing picture, too, because if you're African American, it's like, okay, and then what? So what am I supposed to do with that information? You know, where, 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 where do I go with that? I'm a minority. It's not like, you know, we're, not, we're clearly not going to have an armed revolution to seize any power. So, so what then? You're telling me this, but what am I then supposed to do? Um, it, it, it's terrifying. It's terrifying all around. And it's not even terrifying because we're Americans. I think if I spent any amount of time in any country, um, all countries, you know, have sins in their past. And getting states to confront those sins honestly and directly is really, really hard. The one example, you know, that people often put up is, is Germany. They say, well, well, Germany, you know, was really able, you know, to confront its past. But see, the difference is um, Germany had killed off like 80 to 90 percent of the, of the Jews who lived there. So they didn't have Jews alive as active, you know, political actors to use that history. It's very easy, you know, to apologize for something when there's no one there to draw any sort of consequence from it directly from you in your country, you know, to be part of your politics. Um, it's fine to apologize after you've wiped everybody out, um, you know, for all the good that does. America has a much, much more complicated problem. African Americans are very, very much part of the political process here. Um, and so to, you know, you know, as Americans, you know, to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, this is who we are. You know, uh, and that's okay. Frankly, I don't know that any country has ever done that. You know, I'm really, really clear about that. Um, but we look at ourselves as pioneers, you know, in terms of liberty, in terms of freedom, in terms of enlightenment values. We, you know, we say that we're, you know, pioneers. And I, you know, firmly, firmly believe that reparations is the chance to, to, you know, to be pioneers. You know, we say we set all these examples about liberty and freedom and democracy and all that, that great stuff. Well, you know, here's an opportunity for us to live that out. Having read the article, I. I know that you do not mean reparations as white folks writing checks to black folks, right. Think, right? Right. So in an ideal world, what form would reparations take? In an ideal world, when we talk about social justice, um, we would understand it as, you know, part of healing that heritage and dealing with that, dealing with that legacy. So, for instance, take, uh, the, the, you know, health care right now, right, like Obamacare right now. When you look at a whole swath of the country again, where you know we had you know where enslavement you know we had plantation slavery on a very very deep level, and you look at that and you say, why is there not a you know a, a Medicaid expansion going on there? We would be very clear about why it's not one going on there. And you know those of us you know who make policy, those of us who have power, who sit on our courts, would think about that when we make when we make rulings. Um, we wouldn't be afraid to say that. I mean, right now, following John Roberts' line, uh, I think what he said was to, to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. What we want is a kind of colorblindness. We think that's the answer. Um, but colorblindness isn't the answer. Color isn't the problem. Racism is the problem. And being conscious of racism is the solution. So when you, you, know, you talk about what that looks like concrete, um, I would like to see that in our policy. When we were talking about, you know, ACA, you know, it's very funny. One of the attacks, you know, from the right, from people like Russ Limbaugh, was that this is reparations. Well, not quite, but it would be nice if it could be. <laughs> you know, it would be nice if that was part of it, if you actually did say that. Hey, you know. Obamacare, the affordable yeah, care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing. Listen, an ideal, like taking this outside of the realm of politics, in the you know, realm of just straight talking about this, yeah, this will disproportionately benefit African Americans. And yeah, that's a really, really good thing. You know, it might actually help, you know, heal this heritage that we have over here. You know, and in an ideal world, you could actually say that, you know, um, in a world in which people are actively considering reparation and actively thinking about it and talking about it in a serious way. You could say that. You could say that. And all the more to be said because it's many of the former Confederate states are where the metrics of life are the lowest right. for right. African-Americans. Right. So you're saying that in a just world, that would be rectified. That would be rectified. And we would talk. We would just, we would talk very, very differently. We would not be afraid to, to, to talk about our heritage. And we would not be afraid to talk about racism. And we would be able to talk about white supremacy in our policy. We would not have to retreat to other language like quote unquote, you know, race. Or we would not have to retreat, you know, to other language like quote unquote class. We would say, no, no, no. This is about white supremacy. And we have a problem with this. And we have had a problem with this for a long time. And we need to be conscious of that in our policy. When we pass a stimulus budget, for instance, 
You know, we need to specifically think about helping people who have been injured in our past because they've occupied a certain place in our country. Um, that's what the world looks like to me. You know, it's a, it's, more, it's a consciousness thing, which we don't have at all right now. You know, some critics who greatly admire your work and who acknowledge that indeed white supremacy has been a central organizing principle of American life, find your pessimism, <laughs> that's their term, yes. at odds with the hard evidence. I mean, yes. Jonathan Chait yes. of New York Magazine looks at how, quote, the United States has progressed from chattel slavery to emancipation to the end of lynching to the end of legal segregation to electing an African-American right. president and sees that there are real signs of racial maturing. Yes, yes, well, um, that's the kind of progress that you highlight and you brag about if you're not on the other end of it. You know, if you're Martin Luther King, you know, it's 1965, and you're, you know, making that, you know, long march uh, through Alabama, um, certainly you can look around and say, wow, at one point in Alabama, you know, my ancestors 100 years ago were enslaved right here. Um, or, you know, in this region, you know, um, and isn't it something that, you know, we've progressed to a level that I'm not enslaved. Well, th that's progress. Right. I mean, yes, that is progress. Jonathan Shade is, is, is very, very much right. Also, you know, um, if somebody, you know, uh, every day comes home, you know, and beats you with a tire iron, you know, and then, you know, decides to stop beating you, um, that would be progress. But it doesn't change the fact that you are laying, you know, down on the ground bleeding. You know, this, this is a fact, you know? So yeah, yeah, it's progress, it's progress. But what, what does that then mean? You know, does that mean that everything's over? Does that mean, you know, it's okay? Does that mean it's, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, progresses, you know, that aren't necessarily, you know, celebrated. You know, you say, well, I'm relieved. You know, I greet, I greet that uh, species of progress with relief. I am relieved that all those things happened, you know? But I'm not, you know, gonna dance and celebrate and, you know, that's not to be congratulated, I'm relieved. You know, I think that's, you know, how most African-Americans would greet that. Ta-Nehisi Coates, I hope every American reads this piece. Thank and you, I, I hope so too. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. So brief a conversation hardly does justice to the force of ta Coates' argument in the Atlantic. As you read it, Pay close attention to how officially sanctioned segregated housing in cities like Chicago and New York determined the neighborhoods where African Americans lived, which in turn decided the schools their children could attend. That legacy cast a long shadow. According to a new study, the country's most segregated schools are not in the Deep South. They're right here in New York. And yet another study, a survey of all 97,000 public schools in America by the Department of Education finds race to be the deciding factor in a pattern of inequality that still exists 60 years after the Supreme Court rules segregation to be unconstitutional. Among the findings, racial minorities are more likely to have less access to rigorous math and science classes and to be taught by lower paid teachers with less experience. At our website, BillMoyers.com, we'll link you to that survey, as well as to two very good videos produced by The Atlantic and based on ta Coates' reporting. They tell the story of North Lawndale, that desperately poor community on Chicago's west side, and they look back to the 60s and the Contract Buyers League, when black citizens fought back against Chicago's rampant housing discrimination. That's all at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features.